think about chapter 10. So we've tried to keep it kind of with the chapters to make life a little easier. So I went ahead and I put a due date on there in case anybody's confused because you know, we're in the back half of the semester. A couple of quick reminders. One, this week I will putting, be putting out the uh, academic updates that go into the CAT Center because we have to, to do that. So you will see on the grade book some of your grades may change because it's, it's calculated as a running total. So if you're missing an assignment and I go ahead and put in those zeros so I can calculate what your true grade is, your grade will obviously drop. So make sure that you're aware of that. If you're missing those, fix that quickly before I put in a zero and it makes life easier for all of us. So in light of that this week, if you look at the folder, is there an assignment in the folder this week even? So week 10's folder, there is no assignment. There is the quiz is the only requirement in there and there is a discussion board that we are using as an assignment piece this week. So there is, is a little bit more simplified. And part of that is some of the material that's actually out there is a little out of date. And so I want to talk about what's current with this idea of mobile. Does everybody have a mobile smartphone? And I asked that because last semester I had a student pop up and go, no, nope, my parents only let me have a flip phone. Yikes. Yikes. And I actually have a couple friends of mine that still use flip phones. And every great once in a while, Greg will send me a text on his flip phone. And I know that that must be an important message because of the excruciating amount of time that he has taken to send it on that flip phone. But this idea of mobile devices, and we're also going to talk about a buzzword that's coming out, the idea of IoT. Change slides. There we go. So there are now mobile devices all over that we have to deal with, and that idea of security. So in our cars, some cars now have 16 to 20 or more computers in them. They get updates over the wireless networks. And think about how many times you've done an update on your phone or on a computer and it didn't go right. Well, imagine you're speeding down the highway in your brand new Tesla, and it says, I'm going to do an update. Do we feel safe about that? Yeah, we have to think about that. So there are all kinds of things that are tucked around us all over the place. We have these phones in our pockets. We have all kinds of other devices. So I bought a, a new camera not too long ago. And I probably spent more money than I should have, but these are the things that happen. Well, in that camera, when I turn it on, it's got a GPS. It's got a computer. It connects to Wi-Fi and Bluetooth. Could that be used for security exploits? Yeah, if somebody actually wrote a piece for that. Our phones, or even in our business, are now all computer controlled for the most part. So we need to think about a couple of these. So I'm going to say a tablet's pretty cool. Most of you probably have one. It's great for consuming information, but not really great for creating information. There typically are not very easy ways to input data. But the tablets are, are actually very fast. And my wife, for a lot of her stuff remotely now, we paired a, a Targus keyboard with one of the newer iPad Pros, and it works pretty slick. And it really wasn't any cheaper than a, than a tablet or a conventional laptop. But she likes it. It works, and it hooks into some of the things that she wants to do. So primarily, tablets are, are tend to be less powerful although some of the new Apple tablets are, are the opposite of that. They're touch screen by default. And so some people like that. Some people, if you're OCD about fingerprints on everything, this will drive you crazy. So typically these tablets, well, they're Android or Google or Chrome, because there are a lot of Chrome tablets and things out there now. Microsoft Windows and Apple iOS. If your parents, all they're going to do is go surfing on the web, doing some banking, I'm going to say these are a great tool for them because the other advantage is they're a little harder to compromise. They're written very securely. And in most cases, a lot of these tablets, the worst that can happen is I do a restart on it or restore from factory and it's back like it was originally. So in terms of 
of a population, these are really great. But now we're doing more and more things with our smartphones. And we can look at the data over time at our college about who is a, when in the, the, I can't speak here for a second. In our system, my PSC, we can see what kind of device you're on. And what we're seeing is more and more students over time are now changing their classes and finding their classes and doing everything on their phone. And it makes sense. It's convenient. These things are on us all the time. And if you go in on an Apple or on your Android device and see how much time you're on your phone every day, it should scare you probably. I left my nine-year-old the other day at her, at her mom's, and I sent her phone with, down with her. And I wouldn't normally have a phone with the nine-year-old, but it's a long story. So we do, and I have control over it is kind of the key part there. And one of the things I did is I let it untethered. I just wanted to see how long she would be on there. By noon, she had picked up her phone 92 times. By the end of the day, she had spent almost 10 hours on screen time on this phone. And then I could remind my ex-wife why we put those limits and those kinds of things in place. These are great tools, though. Think about it. We no longer have to buy the DVD package in our car because up-to-date information is available on our phone. In fact, you can use waves, and you can see where the, the police are setting up speed traps. You can see traffic data. They play music. They do all kinds of things. Now, when they say they play music, every major manufacturer has decided to eliminate the 3.5 millimeter jack for a, for a headphone jack, which irritates me, but my own personal issue. We send texts with it. We send pictures. Our lives are on these phones. If I lost my phone, I would be truly lost. I store passwords. I store all kinds of data on there. So we have to be careful what we're doing with it. When I sign up and I get email at Peru on my phone, I'm actually allowing them to use a piece of technology to remotely wipe my phone. It's not a bad idea. Now we're having more and more wearable technology. And if I look around here, I'm going to guess most of you have an Apple Watch or an Android Watch or something similar. Or in a lot of cases, you may be using a Fitbit. So we're wearing it, this technology. And so my watch, now I don't have the latest version, but even this version, I actually can activate it with the phone company, with Verizon. And I don't need my phone even. I can make phone calls and everything on my watch directly. It's handy, but are we giving away a lot of data? Well, yes. It's kind of nice to see, hey, I got my 10,000 steps or whatever your, your uh, goal is for the day. And you can watch your heart rate and different parameters. But where does all that data end up? And we've already had issues where a lot of devices like these are banned on Army and Navy and Marine installations. Because that data comes out, and you suddenly see a group of 500 people all exercising at 6 AM. Hey, I bet that's the location of a base in Afghanistan. So we have to be, be kind of careful about all that data. Do I care if somebody counts how many steps I have every day? No, doesn't really matter to me. But in aggregate, does it give some information? People have actually been convicted of crimes because one of the pieces of evidence was their Fitbit watch. Because it was showing different, they said, hey, I'm sleeping. Well, your watch shows your heart rate was 147 beats a minute. You weren't sleeping. And it will sometimes show location. It's kind of handy. We actually run an app that I can see where my wife and she can see where I'm at. And 99% of that time, that's a really great thing. Except that times I want to go surprise and sneak up to her makes it a little harder. Because if I disable it, suddenly she's like, why, why, why is your location turned off? So we do have to be aware of those, of those consequences. There's always a, a little bit of a price to pay with those consequences of what's happening. So portable computers. Well, what do we mean by a portable computer? So typically, we talk about things like a laptop. And there's not a lot of difference in some cases between a laptop and a tablet. But a laptop tends to be a little faster than the tablets and has more, for example, more accessory ports. You have more USB ports. It may have more features, more memory, more ability to store data. So laptops are really useful for us. 
And most businesses have decided, you know what, we're not doing desktops anymore. The model of the desktop, like what we're doing in here, is obsolete now. Most companies are going with laptops, for the most part, and going with laptops on a docking station. If that employee needs to move, they move. In fact, a lot of businesses, no longer do you have an assigned cubicle or an assigned spot. When you walk in for the day, you go, oh, well, I see that spot over there is open, and I'm going to plug my hardware in and work. So this idea of taking these devices with us, 25 years ago, we would have laughed at you, and now we can get a laptop computer that will run literally all day. And our book makes a big deal of breaking them into smaller and smaller pieces. So they do call something like a sub-notebook, and we've seen them. Some people have these, these small, very small ideas. So if you're in the Apple world, like a, a MacBook Air, very small, little, typically lighter weight, but they will run for a very long time. So And then you have people... Well, I'm going to pick on you. Like your gaming laptop, it's a great laptop for some things, but the battery life isn't so great. So there's, there's trade-offs depending on, on what you want to do with your, your device. A lot of times they now have touch screens on top of it. And then we have this kind of weird model, these two-in-ones. And I've tried them, and I would like to love it. And my wife had a couple of different of the Microsoft Surfaces. And for some things, they worked really well. And including her last one, had a dock and had a Core i7 and 16 gigs of RAM. It was a really nice computer, but it was almost too small to really be usable. And then you had this keyboard that kind of snapped on with magnets. And so things like in an airplane, it wasn't very usable. Or setting really actually on your lap, because the keyboard and it did not really mesh. There's a place for them. I would say the two-in-ones are probably less sales of those than conventional laptops. And having tried to use them, it doesn't always work as, as well as others. The other variation, and I've seen some of our students come onto campus with these and we try to use them, is the idea of kind of that web-based or a Chrome OS book. There are times a Chromebook is really handy. If, if I'm giving a computer to my grandparents or my parents or Somebody who's not very computer savvy, a Chromebook is great. So I worked with a project where we gave all the city councilmen and all the boards, and they needed a computing device that they could get access to email and documents. And we very quickly looked and said, you know what, Chromebooks would be perfect for this because the worst thing that these people can do was mess it up. And what do we do? We do it, there's a three-finger salute on a Chromebook, and you restore it, and then you go back to your account with with Gmail and everything is back like it should be. So typically you don't store a lot of things locally so they're typically not as high-end although you can buy some very expensive high-end Chromebooks that are actually really really nice. Your stuff is stored on the web and you don't install software in the typical manner. So Microsoft Office there is a version for it but it's really done on the web and so everything it's really just one big computer browser. So for that, it works. And for a couple hundred bucks, you can get a pretty decent Chromebook. Give it to Grandma. She can't break anything on it. I say that. The only thing I've seen with them and, and is people manage to break off the ports for the chargers. So the older style with the, the micro USB and the newer ones, even with the USB-C, I've seen people that manage to drop it and break that. And that seems to be really a physical issue, not, not somebody doing something software-wise. And so they're really, really <coughs> a useful device. As a student, though, here, especially in our CMIS program, they're a little limited because some of the things we ask you to do, you don't get to do as easily on a, on a Chromebook. So how do we then connect these to the outside world? So the typical model is we use Wi-Fi. And we have Wi-Fi fairly common. And we've talked about some security issues with Wi-Fi, but it's here on our campus. It's at your house. It's most places you want to be. A lot of cars now, you can buy a service so you can have Wi-Fi in your car. All right, we get Wi-Fi. A lot of these devices, so you can get an, an iPad, you can get a laptop, you can get all kinds of these devices that actually will also take a SIM card and will be able to be connected via cellular signal. Now, that's pretty expensive in a lot of cases. 
But in a government contract, so I worked with a, a sheriff's office, and we did this in their cars. They actually have a tablet in their car. They're paying about $45 a month for data for each one of those. But it's very handy because they can remote back in no matter where they're at. So satellite is, a, is an option. And now that we're getting some new technology coming out of Elon Musk, I think we're going to see that emerge as, a, as another viable option. Now, the satellite our book talks about isn't really very viable, but the new low-Earth Earth orbiting satellites that Musk is putting up, actually around here, from my understanding, some people that are beta testing, they've actually got pretty good signal. And so we're looking at it in another sheriff's office. I've, I've got some contacts in that has asked me. We're looking to see if that's a viable option because even in a lot of these counties, there's not great cell phone coverage. If there's not great cell phone coverage, they don't have great data coverage. So they could potentially pull somebody over, not be able to run their driver's license, and maybe they don't even have good radio coverage in some of these areas, and, and just to be a, aware of that. So they can also sometimes transmit near field communications just like your phone. We can do a couple of different proprietary things, USB, Bluetooth. So there's a lot of different ways we can connect to it. But the most common then right now is USB and cellular, or uh, Wi-Fi and cellular. But here comes where our biggest issue is. What the hell do we do with them when they come into our business? How do we start to harness the power of these devices how do we manage them? Because we're going to have to manage them. When you have the college president here pops in with an iPad, or the VP of finance at a company you're at says, hey, how do I connect my Android tablet to your network? Well, great. Now we have to deal with that idea of how do we deal with these, with these devices. So some companies are saying, well, one of the things we can do is we'll save some money. We'll give you an allowance. And if you want to spend more than the $500 we're giving you, that's great. It's your device. You do what you want. You bring your own device. But that puts a lot of onus on us then to figure out how we can control that. So that's model, the extreme model of, of companies. And sometimes they say, hey, bring your own device, and we're not even paying for it. You can just use it on your own. Great. All the opposite side of that is that idea of completely corporate owned. So here, we typically do more corporate-owned devices. So hey, here's a laptop. It's going to be, be shipped out, configured, controlled by the IT department. And then in the middle is this idea kind of that corporate-owned, but personally responsible for choosing your own device so you get a list of 10 different things. We typically will also thumb, we'll use this idea of a VDI. So, Great, we gave you a laptop, but I don't really want all that data to be hiding out there on your laptop. I make you remote back in through any kinds of technologies. And you have to really, you're working on a computer at the office. And that way all your data is still there. And you don't need a particularly fast computer because all that data is stored in the office or we're storing it on through an online service. Ugh. So. Why do we go to all this desperate effort? Why don't we just say, gosh, you don't need an iPad. Stop. We're not going to use one. What do, we, what do we employees do then? Are they as productive? Will somebody bring in that damn router and plug it in and be getting their own Wi-Fi on my network? Yeah. And it's probably going to be some vice president who has some power that he thinks, man, I really need to have this at work. It can give your employees some idea that, hey, I've got empowerment. I know that I have some choice in this. Maybe you have an employee who hates laptops or hates tablets, and they don't want one. And they say, you know, I really need a desktop. Great. Give them that choice. Give them that choice. So the users get some benefit. And sometimes we get a financial benefit both ways because hey, I needed a computer at home, at work, they needed a computer for me to use, so we do some cost sharing perhaps. Maybe you don't fit the typical mold because we're seeing more and more remote workers, 
Well, if all I had was an AT&T SIM card in your laptop, that's not going to necessarily work if we're here in Peru. So you might have to find your own carriers. Tries to make this as convenient as possible for the employees. Because if I make life easy for the employees, they tend to do more work. If everything we do, it seems like you're trying to have to fight and fight and fight and fight, at some point you give up and you say, well, I'm not really doing this TPS report or whatever it is we have to do. So a lot of benefits. Companies have figured out there's a lot of benefits. Now, there's some downsides. Downsides, what kind of downsides? We have all this different hardware, and maybe our IT department isn't set up to monitor and manage that. They don't know how to fix those particular devices. And now we've got more devices, so what kind of vulnerabilities are on those? Do the firmware get updated? What about connecting? And you, Well, my employees are all working in coffee shops. Does that present some issues? How do I, how do I get around those? And sometimes we even have to think about that deployment model. Do I hire somebody and hand them a $2,500 computer? What's the chance of that coming back? And you think, well, I'm an employer. I just won't pay them if they don't return that computer. But you can't actually do that. You can then file a complaint and actually have them civilly charged or, in some cases, criminally. But you can't do that model that a lot of employers think of saying, well, if they don't bring me back that computer, I'm just going to withhold their pay. Well, you can't do that. The labor boards will come after you about every time, and you end up, end up dealing with it. And as a large corporation, if you have a $1,000 computer out there, is it worth the, the legal fees and things to do it? So we have to worry about that. Now you've got all these people dealing with, with laptops and devices and that data. And we have to figure out ways to keep that data on premises and secured. A huge number, and I think this has probably gone down a little bit simply because we've gotten a little better about moving data to the cloud. But regardless, a huge amount of this data loss is because somebody stole or lost a phone, they lost a tablet, they lost a device. And even if that person can't ever get in there and use it, we still have to report that data is lost. It was stored on there. And one of the best places if you want to get a laptop stolen for some reason, think about traveling. Think about when you're in an airport. Those kinds of areas, they're very, very suspicious. It's very hard to keep things. So, But even here on our campus, we've had laptops, we've had phones, we've had devices stolen. So restaurants, oops. I left my laptop open and I ran to the restroom. And I know people will think you're weird, but I have grabbed my laptop and went in and taken it with me into the bathroom. Because if I'm there by myself, do I trust anybody else? I'm not a very trusting person. I barely trust myself some days. So other things you got to worry about is that idea of shoulder surfing, people looking over your shoulders and seeing what's going on. Well, here that power of these small devices makes life even worse because not only can I look over your shoulder, could I hold my phone up and pretend like I'm on Facebook or sending a text, and what I'm really doing, I've zoomed in on your screen and I'm videotaping it. And the iPhones and the latest Samsungs and things have some really, really darn good cameras. Same way when I'm signing into a building with a punch code. It's pretty easy to catch somebody's code. I did that just the other day to demonstrate that at a, at a physical security, actually, at a power plant. And uh, small, city-owned. And they said, well, we have key codes. And I said, well, let me see if I can find one for you. And uh, within 24 hours, and I went by twice, I managed to do that. And that's because my iPhone 11 has a really great camera. Because I was about 25 feet away, and I could figure out what he's doing. Uh, dang it. So, all these ideas about physical security. So... We also have this idea, and Apple has a greater ability to be secure because of this fact. Apple runs on what's called a closed or a walled garden. You can't see the code, and it only runs on a limited number of devices. 
So Apple can write code that is much tighter and able to be controlled easier than Windows or Android or Chrome because there's only 10 or 12 different things it can run on. It makes it easier now that they're switching to that M1 architecture because, again, we have less they have to change because there's less devices. Google, though, so if we look at Android specifically, one of the problems we have in security is there's a lot of Android devices that are out of date. And they're out of date, especially on phones, because you don't upload directly from Android or from Google. You're getting it from the phone carrier. And if the phone carrier says, nope, we're not going to give you the latest security updates, you don't get them. So it makes it a little tougher on some of these devices. So we go from very tough, very tight, looser. We get to things like Windows. And again, Windows can be on a million different possible configurations. By default, it's going to be a little less secure. By design, it's a little less secure. Oh, great. So what kind of things can we do? Well, the same things that help us in, in some respect can also defeat us. So here we have GPS tagging. A lot of mobile devices have GPS enabled. You can use things like Find My Phone on the Apple, and it will actually tell you where they're at, that phone is, the next time somebody turns it on. Or it may be broadcasting directly, or you can access it remotely. You may be adding other additional GPS tags so that it's broadcasting its location so you can find it. So companies use that on a lot of very expensive tools, hardware, equipment. If I'm going to hand somebody a $10,000 piece of equipment, I probably have it tagged in some way that I can figure out where it's at. So we can also see then geotagging or the idea of geofencing. So I can draw a perimeter and I can say, well, if that laptop leaves this perimeter, I know that something's happened. Or if my $10,000 compressor or whatever it is leaves this area, I can, I can find it and look at it very quickly. So we get, some, we get some additional pieces. Depending where you're at, some of these devices are going to be forbidden. So if you're in a highly secure facility, if you manage to somehow get into a Google facility, for example, you can't take a phone in that's, that's able to record video. And they will, for their own personnel, they will equip laptops without cameras on them on, on, on purpose. So we can also do that remotely, disable some of these devices. The flip side of that is if you don't have one of those little flip slides over your webcam or you haven't put a piece of tape or a sticky note on it, I would do it immediately because there's a lot of exploits where we can remotely gain access to things like webcams. And that's not good. It's not good. So again, part of that security protocol says, all right, we're gonna we're gonna go over those fairly often and we're gonna take a look at it. So what other horrible things can we do? Well, we're connecting to public networks. We know that we have an issue there. Tethering, so if we're connecting to a tethered device, so I do that off my phone quite a bit because I'm too cheap to activate my cellular in my laptop also. So I tether it. Well, if my phone is infected, it could infect the, the device. And I'm not sure that it's necessarily always a safe connection, and I usually VPN through anyway. So all kinds of USB connections. However we're connecting seems kind of frightening. And I will tell you one that has particularly bothered me about connecting. You don't have to say, hey, I've ever been to a casino. But you imagine and you know what a casino looks like. And there's video of slot machines. For their convenience of their customers, a lot of those places now are putting a USB charging port on the front of the, the slot machine so you can plug in your phone to charge while you're playing a, a game. Are you going to plug in your phone into an unknown USB spot? Does that seem? <laughs> Jenny's like, yeah, I might. Huh. If you're going to do something dumb like that, you can actually buy cables that are only power. They don't carry data. Might not be a bad idea. But I see those, and I look at them, and it just boggles my mind that people would be willing to just plug their phone in there directly without knowing what's behind the scenes. 
Now, it probably is all up and up because we all know casinos are really just there to be helpful, friendly people, right? But could they also be putting advertising onto your phone? Yeah. You're giving them access to it. So we have to be careful about where you plug in and what you do with these devices you get. This is my favorite QR codes. So one of the things, I love QR codes. Everybody loves them, right? You, you scan something, and your iPhone and your Android phones now will automatically jump to a website based on a QR code, right? Huh. So we trust everybody we ever get a QR code from, right? So why couldn't we create a QR code that links to a site? We say you're going to, to Google or your company's website, and we create a replica and you log in on that. Are we smart enough to notice the difference? And sometimes we're not because it's, hey, it's a QR code. Let me look at it. There are times it's handy. So in this pandemic event, now most restaurants, if you can actually sit in them at all, don't have menus that they're handing out and around. Great. I look at it on my phone. I pop up a QR code. It brings up the menu off their website. But anything I have to log into, I'm going to get really suspicious about this idea of a QR code. I also get very suspicious of anybody that uses a, a URL shortener. So I don't know where something from Bitly actually is until I click on it. And so it's a little, little scary that way. So an Apple, really a usually tough device. You can't even get software unless it's in the Apple Store. They regulate the Apple Store pretty tightly compared to the Google Play Store. Huh. But 